Now, what we're going to be talking about in a roundabout way is one of the one of the two or three glories of the human mind, which is which is of course the periodic table of Mendeleev. Um, this, this was a marvellous construction because for the first time it made sense of the material world, what the element, what the world was made of. But the funny part was, after Mendeleev had sort of sorted it all out, there was a big bit in the middle which was all a bit confusing and hadn't been, it was, some elements were predicted, some had been seen, sort of, some had been got at a little bit, but there was a swag of things which didn't quite fit the general ideas of metals, the general ideas of things that weren't quite metals, the general, and, and, and this, was a, this was a conundrum because these things were also rather useless, or so we thought in the 19th century. Since then, of course, we found uses for these, uh, for these odd elements, and uh, we're going to hear uh, a talk about why they're, why, they're, why they're important and useful, why, they're, um, why they have strategic importance, and most importantly of all, the strategic issues to do with the fact that they're not distributed around the world in any sort of a fair way. They're, they seem to be, have been given to some countries in abundances that are quite disproportionate to where they should be, where they should be found. So our speakers tonight are Eugene Goltz from the University of Texas, and uh, he's, he's worked for the DOD, and he works on the economics of uh, strategic, uh, strategic minerals. Uh, and also Professor Dudley Kingsnorth from Curtin University, who said he's worked for a long time in the mining industry and, and, and also for a long time on rare earths. So we've got true experts uh, to, to, to give us a guided tour of this, of this issue. So gentlemen, they're going to present uh, in their own inimitable uh, Bib and Bub way. I'll hand over to you guys, and then after they've, uh, we've been given the lecture, we'll open it up for Q and A. Thank you. What I'll be doing this evening is uh, talking about rare earths, giving an introduction to rare earths, saying what they are, giving an overview of the market, and then when I've done that, then the museum will be talking more about the, the geopolitics, and, and as Roger said, after that we'll be having some Q and A. I, I'm totally independent. I don't have any shares or I don't work for any company, so my views are, are, are not uh, based on any commercial concern. They're based upon an independent analysis. And in addition to that, there are a number of forward-looking statements here which I have to assure you that they're not firm forecasts. I just want to um, begin this by saying that in, in uncertain times, we need to think about diversity of supply for sustainability. And uh, China is seeking to diversify its sources of uh, iron ore away from Australia and Brazil. We've seen a lot in the press about the dominance of China, which is correct. But we have to be very careful that our assessment of the rare earth industry doesn't t turn into a a China bashing session. They're, they're very good at what they do in, in, uh, in the processing of rare earths and they have a very important role to play. Um, <coughs> but that's, that's no reason to uh, criticise them unduly. So I, I'll talk about with a brief introduction to rare earths, a recent history of the rare earths market, future demand and supply, China's role, and end up with a few conclusions. Those are the rare earths and um, that people refer to light rare earths and heavy rare earths. Now, there's nothing really magic about that. As you go from the top of the table to the bottom, the atomic weight increases, so the light ones at the top and the heavy ones at the bottom. As you go down the table, they get more scarce and therefore more expensive. Rare earths have unique chemical, luminescent and magnetic properties, which is what, which is how they're found in their major, major applications. And the major application that's driven the industry for the last 15, 20 years is their use in magnets. Now, when you have a rare earth magnet, it's a very powerful magnet. With a very powerful magnet, it enables you to make a smaller electric motor. So initially, the sunny Walkman would not have been possible without rare earth magnets. 
Today, your laptop computer would not be possible without a rear-left magnet enables the drive to be very, very compact. They're also used in, in the drive of hybrid vehicles and in the more expensive vehicles, they're used to put the windows up and down and the seats back and forwards. Because they're lighter, they can save a lot of weight in the vehicle and therefore improve fuel consumption. Rare earths are also used in, in batteries, in lanthanum nickel hydride batteries, that's a rechargeable battery. That's still the rechargeable battery of choice uh, by Toyota for its uh, Prius vehicle. When the Prius was originally introduced, um, it was thought that lithium batteries would have replaced lanthanum batteries by now, but it looks as though with uncertainties associated with lithium batteries, uh, that's lanthanum nickel hydride batteries are going to remain the battery of choice for, for a while, which may, may create problems for a little while. Because the other major use for lanthanum is in fluid cracking catalysts. A catalyst that enables you to improve the efficiency of the amount of petrol that you are able to extract from a, um, a barrel of oil. In, for luminescent properties, rare earths are used in, in lights. Now, in the typical fluorescent light that you see up there, a metre long contains a gram of rare earths. If you want to know, it's yttrium, europium, and terbium, largely. But it's only a gram of rare earths, but those are very expensive rare earths. They're also used in polishing powders. That's primarily cerium. It's got a unique physical and chemical uh, reaction. When I first started in the rare earths industry 24 years ago, that was a major use for rare earths. That was cerium in polishing um, cathode ray tubes. Um, throughout uh, the rare, rare earth market history, technology changes can often have a bigger impact on the rare earth market than, than growth alone. When cathode ray tubes were replaced by flat tubes, the, the consumption of cerium dropped significantly. And currently we're going through a phase where uh, LEDs are replacing fluorescent lights, compact fluorescent lights, lumen for lumen, light power for light power, an LED uses about 10 to 20% of the phosphors that a fluorescent tube does. So we're seeing a big shift in demand for, for phosphors. So I like to use the hybrid vehicle as a, a very fine example of, of the use of rare earths, and, and, and you'll see that in a number of applications in there. If you're wondering um, what uh, UV cut glass is, that's um, Cerium in the glass cuts down to the transmission of UV light uh, in the car. Now, that's not because the Japanese ladies want to pale, retain a pale complexion. Um, by putting 50 cents of cerium in the glass, you can save two to three dollars in, in, in UV stabilizers in the plastic. So, as you can see, rare earths have got a wide range of uses um, and they're continuing to find new, new applications. Over the last few years, we've seen actually very little growth in the industry. And I'll come back to that in more detail, but primarily that's due to the global financial crisis in 2009 and the actions that China took in 2010 with respect to restricting supply and suspending shipments to, to Japan. It's worthy of note that in 2011, the year after uh, China suspended shipments to Japan of, of, rare, of rare earths and supported their dispute over the Senkoku Islands, um, that, China, that Japan invested $1.1 billion in replace, reduce, recycle rare earths. Now, to give you an idea of how important that was, at that time, Japan's consumption of rare earths was about three to $400 million a year. So in other words, they were prepared to invest three to four times as much as that to find alternatives to rare earths or better ways of using them. In actual fact, most of the money went into using them more efficiently. For example, way back then, in a typical hard disk drive, the weight of the uh, magnet in the hard disk drive was about 30 to 40 grams. Today, that same magnet is 10 to 12 grams. So although we see that demand has not increased significantly over the last few years, it is being rare to use in an increasingly increasing number of devices itself through better, better efficiency and in turn also better efficiency of extraction and, and processing. 
So the rare earth market today, when we talk about the rare earth market, it's always talked about in terms of rare earth oxide, REO. Total demand today is about 125,000 tonnes. The value of that market at rare earth oxide stage is only two to four billion, and I'll be returning to that. China is dominant, supplies about 90% and consumes about 70%. There are constraints that China has placed on the market to ensure it maintains its dominant position and continues to add value add processing to create more jobs. In response to that dominance that China has, we have had we have got two projects that are coming online at the moment. Uh, Linus, which has a project in Australia, it's a mine and concentrator at Mount World near Laverton, and then the processing is in Malaysia and a company called Molecorp that has processing facility in mountain parts. Processing rare earths is really not like a mining operation. It's a chemical operation. And both Linus and Molecorp have experienced big problems in the construction and startup of their facilities, which has caused the stock markets great concern. There's some people who don't believe that they will uh, exist in the medium longer term. Personally, I do believe uh, that they will, and probably sometime in the middle of next year, they will be in a position where they'll be cash flow positive. Whether it's an accept or return on the capital invested is, is, is another issue, but they're certainly very complicated operations to bring online, uh, and do take a, a long while, requiring a lot of expertise and a, and a lot of money. In response to what happened in 2010, a lot of Western companies have, be, have put themselves forward as uh, becoming new producers. There are about 200 projects out there at the moment. My best guess is three, maybe four of them are going to be in production in 2020. A lot of opportunity, but significant risk. That's just a um, slide that shows demand last year. And I just, just draw your attention to a couple of things here. If you look under the USA, that figure there, use in, in catalysts, that's because uh, the US, three US companies dominate the production of FCC catalysts, so that's why that consumption is very high, and the US is a major <coughs> supporter of Molecorp and Linus being non-Chinese for the supply of that. China is the major producer of magnets, it produces most of the rare earth oxides, but it produces about 80 to 85 percent of, of the world's rare earth magnets, and if anybody's got any questions, we can talk about that later. When we look at supply and demand, and, and the first table I put up talks about different applications, we look at the growth in each sector. When I forecast future demand and supply, I look at each sector and forecast the growth rate in each, and within that there might be some subtexts upon which that's based. Now, I don't propose to go through that table in any great detail. If people want to copy my presentation, they can have one if they email me and I'll save it to them a PDF format. What I said earlier, magnets is, is dominant growth area, very important area. Phosphorus used to be a very big area, used to constitute about 7% by volume and about 30, 35% by value. Today, it's probably only about 4 or 5% by volume and only about 20, 25% by value. Whereas the magnet sector today constitutes about 25% by volume and about 50% by value. That's just a summary of how we see it over the last few years. When you look at the rare earth market, you cannot look at it as one whole amorphous um, mass of rare earths. There are 17 rare earths, and when the rare earth industry meets at the, at the major conferences every year, the, the major issue is the issue of balance. The ratio in which rare earths are, are consumed doesn't match the ratio in which they're produced. And so therefore, at any one time, there's rare earths that are in surplus and rare earths that are in short supply. And when we look forward, uh, there's a surplus of lanthanum and cerium. Those are two right at the top of that table of rare earths that I see there in greater abundance. Typically, in a project uh, that has light rare earths, they constitute about 70% of the volume. In terms of heavy rare earths, uh, Looking forward, there's an issue there where supply is going to fall well short of 
demand. <coughs> and that's where illegal production in China comes on, and I will return to that. In the case of, of the um, rare earth used in phosphors, if I'd shown this graph a year ago, it would have said that we were going to be short of uh, rare earth for phosphors, but now it looks as though it's not, um, it's not such a critical issue, although at the present time, there's no production outside China. So the rest of the world depends wholly upon China for its supply of heavy rare earths for phosphors. So China. China takes a very long-term view of things. And they started on this journey of rare earth back in 1970. And progressively over the last few years, they've gone further and further downstream, adding value, creating jobs. In running the Chinese economy, the first priority is a case of social harmony, creating jobs so that they, they keep everybody under control and happy, there's no uprising. So that's why there's a big focus on, on rare earths, because there's a great opportunity for them to create high value add jobs and major employment, and rare earths can become the basis of a high technology manufacturing industry. I've referred to this earlier in 2010, China significantly reduced export quotas. Now the numbers are not really important, except that they reduced the export quotas such that the sum of those export quotas plus rest of world supply was less than rest of world demand. And like the normal law of economics, when, when demand exceeds supply, the price goes up. And the prices in some instances went up by a factor of five or six or 10 for a moment, for a moment or two with some some rare earths. Then in September, as I said earlier, China uh, suspended shipments to Japan. So that really caused a big surge in interest in, in rare earths, and that's why we see about 200 projects that are being assessed uh, at the present time. So how does China control um, the rare earths? It has production quotas in place. But unfortunately, those production quotas don't produce enough rare earths to meet demand. They're trying to eliminate illegal production, but that's not successful because in the case of magnets, demand exceeds supply. There have been many tales in the past about their poor environmental management. The government is making efforts to improve that, but it is taking time, will take a while before they meet international standards. Earlier this year, there was a decision by the WTO that the pra these practices that they had in place, export taxes, export quotas, to persuade people to, down, to persuade overseas companies to locate their manufacturing facilities utilizing rare earths in China were illegal according to the rules of the WTO. So the WTO said those practices are, are not allowed under the rules of the WTO. China appealed and the decision was confirmed. Uh, at the present time, China is negotiating with Japan, the EU, and the USA, who brought that action under the WTO, as to how they're going to, uh, what measures they're going to put in place or withdraw uh, to make sure they abide by the rules and, uh, of, of the WTO. The expectation is the export quotas will disappear, the export taxes will be faded out over a period of time, and there'll be a number of other, other changes. This illegal mining until a couple of months ago, I, I thought was probably 15 or 20,000 tons. A couple of months ago, I was at a conference in, in China, and Dr. Chen, who's secretary of the China Rare Earth Society, and uh, he's also deputy chief executive of the China Rare Earth Industry Association, the person who knows the rare earth industry and is respected. That's the slide that he put up. In summary, According to the five-year plan in China, and according to the production figures, last year they produced about 21,000 tons of neodymium and praseodymium, which are used in rare earth magnets. <coughs> but in order to, to produce the 30, 36,000 tons of magnets, sorry, in actual fact the consumption of ne neodymium and praseodymium that went into production of magnets and other applications of neodymium and praseodymium was 36,000 tons. In other words, there was a shortfall of 15,000 tons. So, so the China, the world as a whole, is relying upon 
illegal mining and production in China for 40% of the world's, of China's rare earth magnets, or about 30, 35% of the global or, or world's mine for rare earth magnets. And this is a matter of great concern because it makes it very difficult for people to plan long term if they know that a major component, a major part of, of their manufacturing process is based upon illegal, illegal production. the slide. So what China is also doing, it's, it's not only going downstream, it's vertically integrating. What it's, it's doing, it's selected six major state-owned enterprises to be the vanguard of the industry and carry it forward. This enables China to have greater control over production and prices. Now it's a different scale, but in, in China we have six state-owned enterprises who control about 90% of the production of the world's rare earths. OPEC, which is a low, which is a loose association of 12 countries, controls about 40% of the world's production of oil. It's a very different scale. This is a column, colleague of mine at Curtin University says, China and rare earths is like OPEC on steroids. So it's a pretty powerful uh, tool that they have to control, control production. So as I said, China is progressively moving downstream the rare earth supply chain to create jobs and a high technology manufacturing industry in the interest of social harmony. And this is what pictorially one could see happening, is that there's more and more jobs shifting to China as they progressively go downstream, persuade manufacturing companies to, re to, to relocate their manufacturing uh, facilities in China where they have ready access two rare earths at a lower price because they're exempt from the export taxes. This is real, I was in Europe uh, last week. This is a real concern to Europe because what they see is that jobs are being lost from Europe to China. China is making the most of its rich abundance of rare earths for, for its own, own economy. So for the rest of the world, this is, this is a real issue in that China can become very dominant in the manufacturing sector and what we need to do is to look to diversifying our sources of rare earths to ensure that we have, we retain a fair portion of manufacturing industry outside China. And with that, I'll hand over to you. <laughs> I'll do my best to follow on to, to Douglas' introduction to the rare earths industry. So um, we tried to coordinate a little before, uh, hopefully we won't kind of left gaps. So normally I would also present a little bit of an overview about the rare earths industry and I sort of figured Douglas covered that and I'm hoping to build on what he had to say to talk about my own views of, of uh, the, the type of vulnerability or really what I would say is actually not that big a vulnerability because of concentration in the rare earth market. So, um, you know, there's a little preview of the end. Simple commodity or strategic vulnerability, <coughs> I come on down somewhere in between, but closer to the commodity side, right? I say, this is an important, it's a valuable commodity. There's money at stake, but whether it's strategic or a, or a, a critical vulnerability for countries in a national security sense, that's another matter. So I guess I should, I should start, though, um, by uh, saying, like Dudley, a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, I got into the rare earths business. I started learning about this when I was uh, working in the Pentagon. Um, prior, prior to that, I had background in economics and national security, which is kind of what I do for a living as a professor. But uh, so I ramped up my knowledge, but I was one of a whole bunch of people working on this issue in the Pentagon. I'm not responsible personally for all the major policy decisions, any of the major policy decisions. I was part of the process. And what I say now is speaking for me as an analyst, not for anything uh, official. Also, I would say, I'd like to thank one of the wonderful things about working at one of the biggest research universities in the United States, the University of Texas at Austin, is um, uh, we have a wonderful array of research centers that have been endowed for various reasons. And we have the Edward A. Clark Center for Australia and New Zealand Studies, 
which uh, uh, sponsored by Crip here. I'm very grateful to them. So Edward Clark was the ambassador to Australia during the 1960s, and uh, you know there have been strong UT ties to Australia going back much longer than that. But they raised an endowment um, uh, to formalize those ties and named it for Ambassador Clark, and um, uh, were much in favor of strong ties between Texas and Australia. Um, so <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about today mostly is about um, whether there's any geopolitical leverage in the rare earths industry. So whether you can gain political advantage by manipulating the rare earths market by saying, well, I'm not going to sell as much, I'm not going to sell to you, only to you. Somehow, by having a government intervene in the market, generally on the supply side, to gain important, to, to coerce other countries, to gain important political leverage. There are other things that might lead you to think there could be a geopolitics of rare earths, the way we talk about geopolitics of oil. People ask questions about other issues, other international political issues that pertain to rare earths. I'm happy to talk about those, but in a short presentation, this is what I'm going to focus on, just for a few slides and a few comments. Um, and so I thought I would start, the way I was going to work through this in just a couple of slides, I'm going to talk about, in principle, what would give what would make an industry or a commodity a source of geopolitical leverage, a source of political influence? And then for a couple of slides, I'll talk about the, 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 what made people think in 2010 especially, at the peak of the crisis when China allegedly embargoed exports to Japan. I'm just going to point to Dudley and say, he said they really did it. Um, and uh, we're going to go with that. And uh, um, uh, that, um, uh, at that peak, there was a frenzy of fear <clears throat> about uh, how much uh, influence one could gain from rare earths. And then the market changed, as Dudley talked about some. And I'm going to talk about how those changes might have affected political leverage and kind of conclude with what that tells us about the potential both for rare earths and in general to gain political leverage by manipulating markets. So I think in the ideal industry, these would be the characteristics that would, you know, there might be some others, there might be wrinkles in particular industries, but in general, if you were looking for an industry that you could use as a sender of a geopolitical message to influence a particular target, what would you want? Well, you would want to control all the supply, right? So if you control the 100% of the supply, that's the best because then nobody else could, you don't have to get anybody else's cooperation, right? OPEC, a dozen countries, a handful of them are the core of OPEC that really matter. If they want to do something, they all have to agree. <laughs> they have to negotiate and all decide they want to do this jointly. But the more concentrated, the fewer people you have to get on your side if you want to manipulate the market. The center controlling all supply helps get leverage. Even better is if the country you're trying to influence, if you, the country you're trying to get leverage over, is the only person who buys that product from you. right? Because if you're trying to, to influence one country at a time, but you sell to a whole lot of other countries also, you have the problem that those countries that you want to keep selling to might buy the product from you and resell it to the person who you're trying to prevent from getting the product, right? So if there were five countries, if you wanted to target Japan, but you were also trying to sell lots of rare earths to, I don't know, let's pick some Asian countries, right? Uh, 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 Korea, the Philippines, Vietnam, and Australia, right? All in the same region. You could say, well, we're not selling to Japan anymore, but if Japan really wanted it, they would buy some of what you gave to Korea, they would divert that to Japan, right? You wouldn't have as much leverage as if the target was the, with the main person who wanted it. You didn't have rare earths or anything else just sloshing around in a global market. Um, the third thing which people focus on quite a bit, and the reason why people got very exercised about rare earths, is uh, consumer demand, you want it to be large and inelastic, right? So you want the consumers to want a lot of it so if you cut them off, it has a big effect on their economy, on their preferences, on the things that they want. 
And you want it to be the case that no matter how much the price changes, people still want the product. So even if you jack up the price a lot, one of the problems when you jack up the price, if you're a monopolist, is that people stop buying, right? It, it reduces the equilibrium quantity of consumption. But if demand is inelastic, you have to buy it anyway, right? And so you can really squeeze someone if there's a product that no matter how much it costs, they want to have it, and you're the only person that sells it to you. So consumer demand being large and inelastic helps gain leverage. And that's one of the things that contributes to that is if substitute products are lousy, right? So you can't switch it out for something else. Um, and these two things combined is what people really thought about rare earth. So I didn't keep a slide about this, and I'll just highlight what Dudley said. He went quickly over that graphic of all the uses of rare earth. People talk about rare earths like fairy dust. They're wonderful magic you can sort of toss into all kinds of industrial processes, and poof, wonderful things happen, right? It just makes you know makes them better. It makes all kinds of great things. And so these were these are, are um, and and it's and it's specifically politically resonant type of demand. Like this is great fairy dust. It's not fairy dust that you know people go to the club and party or whatever with. It's not that kind of thing. If this is this is um, uh, defense products that people very excited because maybe a magnet is used as an actuator in a missile guidance system, or maybe they're used in lasers or in certain kinds of sensors or in radar emitters for advanced radars. These kinds of things. So defense, that sounds scary to people. It makes people think, oh, it must be strategic. Or the whole green energy revolution, right? So the big quantities of demand that people are projecting are you use magnets in generators, you use magnets in lots of products, so like in a wind turbine. And so if the wind industry takes off, potentially that's a lot of rare earths. It's the Prius, all of those kinds of things. So those are politically resonant types of demand. Um, the last thing is if the product need is time sensitive, right? Like if you need it now, you would have to disrupt the production line to, to delay it. If you, that would also increase the leverage. I'm not going to focus on that. Anyway, so to briefly recap some of what uh, 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 Dudley was talking about leading up to 2010, um, the Chinese sort of took over the market, uh, increasing in the 1990s. The, the, the main non-Chinese mine, in fact, the mine that historically supplied much of the rare earths consumed in the world and not past California, closed in 2002, left China dominant in the market. Um, Dudley talked about China rationing down their export quotas. Uh, and um, they produce an increasing proportion of rare earth metal, downstream products like magnets, compact fluorescent light bulbs, that gained this market dominance. The main point is it looked like with this level of concentration, OPEC on steroids, right? This should work for geopolitical manipulation if anything works. And of course, on the demand side, it also looks good for geopolitical manipulation, right? So um, these kinds of products were um, uh, very sensitive products. They're products that people cared a lot about. There were a lot of products. It was spread across the economy. So people draw links. <coughs> Dudley talked about this whole sector is two to four billion dollars maybe in the economy. That's actually very small, right? The world economy is a lot bigger than two to four billion dollars. So you're trying to get a lot of leverage over manipulating two billion dollars of industry. It seems like that might actually be difficult to do. But people who tell the scare stories say, yes, that's just the cost of the rare earths themselves. But if you think about the, the value of the products that use rare earths, add up all the Priuses and all the wind turbines and all the missiles and all the airplanes and all of these things, the, all the cell phones and disk drives, they talk about somewhere in the supply chain of trillions of dollars worth of products, there's a nickel of rare earths, right? And so if you want to exaggerate the impact, which people talked about, people got you know, generated the fear, they said this touches a huge portion of the economy. Um, and this maybe is the most important thing, because China, of course, turned out to want to gain influence, wanted to manipulate Japan. And downstream production was really concentrated in Japan, because especially 
for intellectual property reasons, some Japanese companies owned key intellectual property for making magnets out of rare earths. And as a result, for intellectual property reasons, there was concentration in the downstream market that made that downstream market <laughs> vulnerable to Chinese upstream manipulation as of 2010. So the market is large, important, inelastic, and relevant to politics, especially in Japan. So it looks like this is a good scenario for geopolitical manipulation. But the truth is, it was only for an instant. It was fleeting. So you can't, so sometimes everything aligns just right, and you have a second where you might get leverage. But then, poof, Kaiser Jose vanishes, right? The, the, the leverage goes away. I don't know, you guys may not remember the movie The Usual Suspects, but, but uh, um, uh, there was just a second when there was a moment of leverage. But private investors, this is the, the interesting thing. People saw long before the crisis that there was an opportunity because they understood that people downstream who were buying rare earths products were gonna be nervous about a Chinese monopoly. And it didn't take just governments to understand that, right? So it wasn't waiting for government policy to say, oh my gosh, here's a crisis, here's a bunch of money to fix it. Private investors started in the early 2000s, right? Linus was starting up in 2002, you know, when they really started investing. In fact, even before that, Dudley knows this history very well. Uh, but uh, people were, were they, business sees the market concentration and reacts because they view that as an opportunity to enter the market and make money through competition. So the significant Chinese, non-Chinese supply was already coming online, it was already scheduled, the investment was already being made when China had its peak influence in 2010. And by 2013, it was online, there was actual production. Now, it's not in every element. We can talk about the details. There is actually production in every element. It's just different amounts in different elements, right? And maybe there's some amount of Chinese leverage left. But think about it this way. The whole rare earths industry was only two to four billion dollars. And if many of the high volume parts of the rare earth industry no longer are really concentrated in China, even if some of the smaller uh, volume elements still are quite concentrated in China. Now China's geopolitical leverage is resting on a smaller and smaller and smaller pillar, right? It's not all rare earths, it's only resting on yttrium, or it's only resting on uh, dysprosium, or these smaller rare earths that are a subset. So you're down to a few hundreds of millions of dollars. On the demand side, we had adjustment to uh, uh, Dudley talked about this some, so I won't spend much time. But the main point is there's actually innovation happening in the rare earths industry. And many people feared that because China was dominating the production and dominating the manufacturing, has so many scientists working on rare earths, that China would get a lead that no one could ever catch up to. And that really hasn't proven to be the case. In the past five years, there have been quite significant innovations in the rare earth industry in all phases. Kind of new techniques used in mining and separation, ultimately in recycling as a new source of demand, and especially in magnet production that demands less rare earths for equivalent magne magnetic uh, capabilities, right? All of these innovations are happening outside of China, right? It's, you know, some of the production ends up in China, whatever, but there's all kinds of smart capability outside China. But just because China is producing the products doesn't mean China is gaining a huge intellectual edge. So I don't want China to be a big bogey. So the bottom line, is there a strategic vulnerability? Well, I think the answer is they had a brief window in which they could manipulate the market for political gain. And so in this alleged embargo case, you know, the New York Times wrote that, that uh, uh, Japan suffered a humiliating defeat. And I don't really think it was that big a humiliation because it didn't matter in the end. So, so Japan gave back the captain of a fishing trawler that was badly <laughs> behaved to the Chinese. They didn't put the guy in prison, they gave him back. But China did not get the islands, right? The islands are still administered by Japan. The international legal status of the islands has not changed. No country in the world said, oh my gosh, 
China has leverage in rare earths. We're going to recognize China's claim to these disputed islands, right? They got very little for all of the hoopla over rare earths. And it turns out, in peacetime, in normal situations, China has a big role in the industry. But there's a complete supply chain outside of China. It's not very big, but for high priority uses, if push came to shove, you can do pretty much everything you want to, completely leaving China out of the picture, right? And the question is, so in, in peacetime, when China's offering things cheaply, you buy from China. But if China wanted to mess around, do you have alternatives? And the answer is yes, right? So um, I would say rare earths are a valuable commodity. I think the market's growing. I think it's a very exciting product. It's very salient products. I think there's money to be made in this market. I think many investors are going to lose their shirt because there are 200 companies running around and not that much room for that many companies in the market. But somebody, not sure exactly who, I have some ideas, but I'm not going to forecast. I'm not a crystal ball guy, right? Neither is Dudley, he says. But uh, uh, somebody's going to make a lot of money, right? But that's different from strategic. And so I'll just leave you with this. Um, uh, I wish there was a better cover, but uh, on Monday, I had a, a report published by the Council on Foreign Relations in the United States, you can find on this, at this website, um, that talks about some of these strategic issues, it goes into some more detail. Anyway, if you're interested, I hope you'll look up the Council paper, and uh, we're happy to talk more and answer some questions. So thank you. Uh, George Green from the Security College. Um, I, th I thought I might invite you to, to expand a little on how you're thinking about national security. It, it almost seemed like you were saying national security um, in this context equals strategic defence needs, and I imagine it isn't quite as narrow as that. So can you just maybe give us an idea of what, what you've got in mind when you talk about when it comes to, when it, comes to it, we can meet our needs? And that might um, prompt a bit more discussion too. Sure. <coughs> um, so defining national security is not easy, right? And some, somewhere in the mix, there probably yeah, are. Thirty prosperity. seconds will do. There probably are. <laughs> yeah. There probably are prosperity concerns somewhere in the mix, right? So um, if somebody can bring your economy to its need to its knees in the short term, you want to prevent that as a as a protection of you know against threats to national security. Um, uh, the truth in, in rare earths is there's a whole range of uh, essentialness in the consumption of the products, right? So um, uh, you can go online if you want, go to Amazon, that's assumed true in Australia, not just in the United States, and you can order yourself uh, 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 some rare earth magnets that are a toy for your desk, like an executive toy. Balls of murder, you can jump them and snap together, they're really cool. Um, we don't really need those, right? They're kind of cool, but. Uh, or uh, fancy headphones, you know, uh, 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 Dr. Dre's company, Beats Inc., uses a fair amount of rare earths in their, in their bud headphones. Um, that's not national security. I mean, it's nice, but don't get me wrong, I have nice headphones. I just flew across the Pacific and I was glad. But you can get rid of a whole lot of the important demand if there's a price spike or a problem or someone manipulating it, and it's clearly not a national security threat, it's an annoyance, right? Now, it's not just defense needs that might be noticed by politicians to the point where they would think it's national security, right? But, but if you're trying to think of, a, of, an, in, of an interruption in the market, a disruption in the market that's big enough to qualify as national mm -hmm. security, it's got to be pretty big. So defense needs in the United States vary, for example, element by element, but um, generally they're less than 10% of total consumption, right? And there's just enough rare earth sloshing around that even moving beyond defense to other things you might think of as critical needs, you can satisfy that with stuff that's sloshing around and with on-the-fly innovation. Too. This is Bolton from the Fenner School. Uh, which is the environmental area of ANU. Um, I was just wondering if you had any comments about the environmental impacts of mining rare earth um, minerals 
And um, if that presented any problems for China, you know, you hear about these environmental riots and things, and I'm not exactly sure where these are located within China, and if that has any importance at all. Thanks. Um, it, it, it has a it um, has a big impact within in China, and they recognise that. But the rare earths are so important to them that the pace at which they're enforcing that environmental uh, better environmental standards is very is very slow. Uh, there is, and there are um, particularly now we realise that illegal mining is such a large portion. I think original equipment manufacturers will put more pressure on China to reduce the amount of illegal mining that's, 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 taking, that's taking place. Um, Keith Bradshaw, you'll probably be aware, did an excellent series of exposure articles on, on the impacts of, of, illegal, of illegal mining. New York Times. Yeah, sorry. Oh, look, unfortunately, China's need to create jobs and social harmony uh, sometimes means that they, they, the, the, the environment comes second, but they, I think they're, they're certainly recognising now that they can't neglect it any longer. But it's going to take a long time to um, to correct that. In the West, we have different we, we do have different standards. Um, they are raising the standards in in China. Uh, for instance, some of the emission standards, some of the standards with respect to water, are higher than they are in Europe, and and they they make a lot of that, but they. They tend to enforce it fairly strictly on the on the companies where they have foreign ownership, like Molycorp has subsidiaries in China. So does Rodia and Solvay, and so do some of the Japanese companies. And they allow the Chinese companies longer uh, to, to meet their standards. So, in answer to your question, it is it is a concern, um, and it's being rectified, but not as quickly as as we would like or probably. So I want to add one quick thing about the U.S. side of this, which also. Lots of controversy on environment in Malaysia and Australia, to be right to say. Uh, um, many people think Mali Corp got closed down in 2002. It's, you know, Mali, that mine in the US was open for a long time, closed for a few years, and now it's reopened. And they associate with environmental problems because, kind of, the proximate cause at the end, there were some environmental incidents that they didn't want to spend the money given the market situation to ameliorate at that time. But Mali Corp has one of those innovation areas I talked about, they're using some different processes now that involve, say, recycling of some of the acids that are used in separation, or a um, better way of disposing of some of the, the, the waste that they have. They make a paste out of the wastes so that it doesn't blow in the atmosphere as easily, or a series of, a series of things. They've got new technology that is not um, widely used internationally, and they claim not only is this better for the environment, but it's, that it's cheaper. That a result of this is that, you know, we'll see the proof in the pudding as the market competition takes place, but their claim is that their production costs are now lower than many of the Chinese production costs based on their environmental improvements, right? Which is a huge step if it actually turns out to be true. Thanks, we're going to throw to a geo question now. Yes, my name's Richard Arculus. I'm with the Research School of Earth Sciences here at Yan Yu. I've got a couple of questions, actually. You might agree, this is, the second one is unfair. But the first one, as an investor, the illegal mining sounds really quite attractive. There's an opportunity to make lots of cash if we could get into it. But the second one, is there another metal or metals that you think are closer to your definition of uh, strategic vulnerability, such as the platinum group metals? If you're a consumer of rare earths, the illegal mining is great, right? So especially um, uh, the parts of China I don't know if Doug, you would want to say this or not, so you know, maybe we'll want to chime in or maybe you'll want to run away from this, but the parts of China where they have the biggest difficulty enforcing the rules are the parts are in southern China. It's the most mobbed up part of their rare earth business, and uh, that's the part of their rare earth business that produces the things that we think are scarcer and we're more worried about. So the southern Chinese are where they produce the, the heavies, and so the fact that the government can't control the illegal mining of precisely the things that they might be able to get leverage out of if they could control it suggests that the consumers, now nobody wants to rely on illegal mining as Dudley was saying because you don't know if that's reliable supply. Like what if they did successfully crack down on organized crime? But 
Um, but the fact that it's so hard to crack down on organized crime suggests to me there's a pretty reliable supply of heavy rare earths. And uh, you know, that makes me more comfortable on the demand side. Um, now, are there other things that, that are real vulnerabilities in the economy? Yeah, I mean, from time to time, like these things uh, uh, pop up. But in general, um, uh, they're fleeting and are easily exaggerated. So in just a few years in the United States, we've gone through panics on national security grounds about titanium supplies, about beryllium supplies, now about rare earth supplies. There was a mini one about lithium that you know was coming and going, and no one knows what's really you know. These things all turn out to be not as big a problem as people worry. Like we've never had one that's turned out to be I mean, uh, never is a long time, so don't you know take that. To, I, I tend to exaggerate a little bit when I speak, but 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 the answer is I'm not freaked out, right? That's you know, and and if you find specifics. There are policy tools that you have available, but you should hesitate to use them because I really do believe that not just government is looking for this, but business is looking for opportunity. Like when there is concentration in the market, somebody thinks I can make a lot of money here, and that the problem is goes away. Well, I, 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 I do I, like that sorry. definition of, uh, of organized crime, the positive spin on it. It's reliable. It's wonderful. Oh, yeah. um, as a result of what, what, what happened w w with rare earth, there's, there's been a big change in procurement procedures in, in many of these industries. If you, if you simplify it and you say there's nine steps between the mine and the showroom, prior to 2010, people only dealt with somebody two steps down the supply chain. Now, once, uh, once people realised, I mean, people in BMW didn't really know quite what rare earths were. They sort of did. But they, somebody bowls into their office and says, well, as a result of what's happened in China, um, the price of the motors that puts the windows up and down and the seats back and forward is going to double next year, and we're not sure whether it's, there's going to be enough in two or three years' time. There was a radical change in procurement procedures. And now, in the larger companies, whenever there's a new product comes out, people look at the whole of the supply chain. It was very interesting. In 2012, I went to Europe on a visit, and in three major companies, they changed their procurement director, vice president, whatever you saw, thought they were. And the person in charge was somebody, in each case, was a somebody who come from research, who understood the total supply chain. You know, what happened at the front in terms of mining right the way through. And you'd be delighted to hear, of the three, two of them were women. And they all came out of... They all came out of research. So now, particularly at General Electric, whenever they bring out a new product, a new piece of equipment, they have a look at the total supply chain and say, this great innovation, if we put this in practice, is this going to cause a problem in the world? Are we going to grossly inflate prices? And it is something uh, that's now very much part and parcel of, of development of, of a new product. So I'm afraid to be a to be a procurement director, you no longer have to be a smart-ass lawyer who can negotiate a good contract. You've got to understand the supply chain and negotiate with everybody along the supply chain to make sure that your process is the most efficient. Uh, hi, David Goyne. I, I guess I'm here really to satisfy personal security. It's a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. And uh, very good economics, I think. Uh, look, two questions, I guess. One of which is, Illegal supplies, are they people running a legitimate mine diverting part of their production, or are they separate holes in the ground, uh, completely illegitimate? And two, what are the barriers of in to entry for other people opening up a mine to compete in this market? As Eugene said, most a large part of this illegal mining is, is in the south, and it's where they mine these very high value rare earths. The, we don't get into too much detail, the rare earths are in the ground in clay. And what they do is they inject acid into, into the ground and, and they dissolve the rare earth and come up to the surface. And then as a result of that, they pollute uh, the, the, water, the water resources. And because they're high value, um, it's, they, the mine, the sites are not very big. So they can go in and, and put the pumps in and, and all, the, all the structures and, and do it overnight and, and move and move uh, within a few days. And it is, it's, it's, uh, it's illegal and, and uh, makes a lot of, lot of people a lot of money. I, I really think that 
we've got to perhaps persuade the Chinese government, if they increase their production quotas, there's less incentive for illegal mining. Now, whether, <coughs> now, whether those production quotas are less than they should be through incompetence, or whether it's a deliberate strategy because they know the illegal material is a lot less, and therefore is, is helping the Chinese, the wholly owned Chinese companies, to compete very successfully with the foreign companies who really have to toe the line in terms of buying approved material. It would be hard to say. So, um, uh, barriers entry to enter a new mine around the world, again, certainly, you know, tons about this, we can focus on that as the answer today. Um, you know, all of these 200 people with projects they're dreaming of bringing to fruition, um, they all have a story about how they have a real prospect, right? I mean, there are lots of places around the world where you know, rare earths, the, the, the cliche that's in newspapers all the time now is rare earths aren't really rare, right? I mean, they're sort of everywhere. You go outside and you dig for a while, maybe you'll find them in a non-commercial concentration, right? So, so, but to start up from scratch, to get all the, um, uh, to get the art of doing it just right takes a long time and a lot of serious backing, right? And there are problems with many, Geological problems that other people in the room are much better qualified to answer than I. But you know, a lot of rare earths are associated with various radioactive elements, which gives trouble to some of the mining prospects. Or they have geology where people know there's a rare earth, but it hasn't been uh, processed in commercial scale from that geology in the past. So there's new things to figure out, which means that there are substantial barriers to entry for a greenfield mine in a lot of places, but there are also a lot of non-greenfield mines. There are ones that are sort of closer to commercialization that you could build on. The way I sometimes like to look at it is there's, there's a ton of lithium in a, cub, in a cubic kilometer of sea, but that doesn't mean it's economic to extract the lithium. And what we have here is a whole lot of rare earth resources, relatively few of which are going to are, are proven to be economic. Um, thank you. Uh, Tony Harris, uh, I suppose I'm an interested amateur. Um, I have two questions, one for each of our speakers. The first perhaps is an easier one. I, I understand there's a mine in Mongolia, the largest uh, producer of uh, rare earths, which produces it as a byproduct of iron ore. And the economics of iron ore is changing, so does that affect that large producer of rare earths? The second question to, to Eugene, um, we shouldn't be surprised, I suppose, that everyone wants to be a monopolist and China in this area has got more advantages than most. But if you try to, um, um, if you try to hypothetically adjust for the 40,000 tonnes of illegal production, which, which is presumably what China's trying to do as well, would the outcome be much different than, than we've seen so far? Yeah, yeah, um, Tony's correct. Um, Bayanovo, it's a mine in Inner Mongolia. It produces rare earths as a byproduct uh, of an iron ore mine. It produces about 60% of China's rare earths and about 70% of the world's uh, light rare earths. China's uh, production quotas are 105,000 tonnes, of which 60,000 tonnes are allocated to Bayanova. Two years ago, there were a whole series of articles about the problems associated with the mine and their control of the tailings. The Chinese government has assured us that they're investing money to make sure that the operation of the mine is not in jeopardy as a result of, of those, and they're, they're carrying out a lot of remedial work on, on the tailings stand. But, more recently, um, the, the price of iron ore is impact, could well impact on Bayanoba. When the price of iron ore was $130 to $150 a tonne, the percentage of local iron ore that went into their steelmaking was about 70%. When the price <coughs> fell to $100 a tonne, the, the amount of local ore that was used was about 50%. So one would assume that as the price of Iron Ore Falls for, it, sorry, the company that owns the mine is called uh, Bautau Iron and Steel and Rare Earths. So they produce steel and rare earths. So as the price of iron ore falls for their competitors, they have to compete. So they 
most of the iron, uh, Chinese steel makers are tending to use more and more foreign material. But as they do that, then they mine less. So there could be an impact on, uh, theoretically, there could be an impact on, on uh, the supply of rare earths. I don't think that'll happen. I think what will happen is they will continue to mine sufficient amount of material to generate the rare earths that they want. But the good news is for those people outside China is that this will inevitably add to their costs. So it should, it should enable uh, the differential between their costs and our costs uh, to, be, to be reduced. So all strength to the uh, iron ore producers in the Pilbara, it might well help some of our rare, ore, rare earth producers by putting pressure on the, the cost of Van Over. So to, to, to try your question on uh, taking account of illegal production in your behavior as a monopolist, right? So, I mean, the Chinese government wants to control the industry, and so their first priority is to stop the illegal production, right? And I mean, they've been saying this for 20 years, right? I mean, there's nothing new here. It's just hard to stop. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, in principle, what a, what a monopolist would do in kind of an economics model would be to say, at whatever price I'm setting, I need to take account of the competitive fringe let them peel that off in the market and say, now how much demand is left for me as residual demand as a monopolist, and then I'll set my production accordingly, right? So there's the fact that there is a competitive fringe doesn't stop you from gaining market leverage, from gaining rents, but it probably does stop you from getting geopolitical leverage in terms of the ability to do a complete cutoff to bring someone to their knees or to threaten to be able to do that to make them cave in on something that matters to them, right? So, you know, if you imagine the kind of scare stories that people told in the U.S. press at the time, you know, in 2010, 2011, they were talking about, well, if the U.S. is in a conflict situation with China in the future, not that we would ever think that could happen because we like China, but if that ever did happen, right, if you're in a conflict situation, what if they cut off our rare earths at that moment, we wouldn't be able to buy new magnets to build more missiles to shoot at China, right? And that was the kind of story they were telling. And um, uh, the first thing to point out is we already have a lot of missiles to shoot at China, and those missiles wouldn't stop working just because we couldn't buy rare earths at that point, right? But also, the amount that we would be buying for new missiles to shoot at China is, is not, um, not enough to overwhelm the other sources of demand. So again, it's not getting you in a national security sense. It's maybe getting you, China gets to earn extra money. And as consumers, we resent paying the extra money if they manage to take account of illegal production. I'm Llewellyn Hughes from the Crawford uh, School here at the ANU. We are in Canberra, so I thought I'd give both of you uh, the opportunity to talk about what you thought, uh, given your understanding of the issue, what you think the optimal uh, policy should be for governments, uh, both uh, to Dudley in Australia and uh, to Eugene uh, in, in, in the United States. You could think about that in different ways. It sounds like national security should be relatively disinterested, and you know, the WTO is a useful uh, avenue to think about issues of market power. Um, but national security policy might be one area uh, you could think about. Um, reducing the market power uh, of China, that is kind of dealing with monopoly issues, might be another area in which you think national policy might play a useful role in either country. And then lastly, for industry policy, that is, you know, is there an opportunity here to secure some of these rents in either, uh, either country? And if so, what would be the optimal policy? What part of the supply chain, perhaps, um, would be useful for doing so? Thank you. Uh, I'll go first, and then uh, uh, Dudley can save Australia. Um, uh, work. So, um, uh, so the traditional thing the United States does when they get in a panic about any product, really, is um, uh, have the government initiate a program to buy a bunch of stuff. Right. So. We're worried about um, alternative energy. Uh, the government says, uh, let's give a huge tax credit to people who install solar panels this month. And um, uh, the electric generating companies 
create giant solar uh, 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 fields that they're going to use to generate power, and then eventually people get tired of paying the subsidies, they turn off the subsidies, and that electric uh, uh, facility uh, goes bankrupt and gets closed down because it was only, at current technology, it only works with the subsidy. Um, in rare earths, we managed not to do that. Like Our instant response was not, the price is really high, let's buy ourselves a big stockpile of rare earths now that the price is high. Um, and uh, uh, you know, it was kind of a small miracle uh, uh, <laughs> that that happened. Um, but what we did instead, which makes more sense, like so, in terms of a reasonable policy, is we did spread around a relatively significant increase of money for R and D in the rare earths business for new production technologies to make it cheaper for new uses that use less rare earths. Uh, you know, a spread of kind of the things that government, in, in a fairly simple understanding of, of uh, um, you know, the government's advantages and disadvantages of spending money in an area where you could easily tell a, a quite reasonable story about a market failure that justifies good government spending would be at the, at the front end of the R&D process. And that's, you know, I think a very reasonable thing to do in areas where you identify critical materials or shortfalls. So like, when people say, well, you should have a, a policy to expand production capacity, which the United States has actually done in some of the other metal, metals crises we've had, um, usually that means government subsidizing expanding production capacity with current technology, which would have already existed if it was good you know, competitive technology. So it's a money losing proposition to subsidize that, better to subsidize developing the new technology for the future. Think about the future, not the present. Um, uh, and um, uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing to say about current technology, about spreading the money around that way, um, uh, to increase plant capacity at present as a response, right? So that would eliminate the monopoly by increasing production capacity outside the monopoly area, is that again, businesses aren't dumb, right? If there's a nickel to be made by attacking the monopoly through new entry over here, we have robust capital markets. Mollycorp, you know, <clears throat> at the time it looked like Mollycorp did very well because just before the peak of the crisis, Mollycorp raised $500 million to fund their uh, initiative to reopen the mine. There was a lot of money they got from private markets because people were excited about demand prospects in rare earths. It turned out just a little bit later, the price skyrocketed and then Mollycorp felt bad because they said if we just waited until October instead of August, we could have gotten a billion dollars. <laughs> and then the price crashed, and then Bali was like, thank God we got $500 million, right? So like, when there's an opportunity, the market works. And uh, Bali became very concerned that the government was gonna spread around a lot more money and develop competitors to Bali who'd done the right thing by going to capital markets <laughs> and getting money to invest. So the long answer is, the short answer, that was a long way of saying, invest in R&D at an appropriate level from the government, um, otherwise be very careful. Yeah, I, I would support what Eugene says, that governments are no good at picking winners. They, <laughs> they've invested in tin stockpiles a long time ago and lost a lot of money, and they've yeah. invested in, in other companies. In, in the States, the, the um, They've actually put a lot of money into something called the Critical Materials Institute. And they've been promised $25 million over five years, and that's got to be matched by industry. And it's for research, but it's not, it's not, it's, it's talked about as being part of research, but it's not research. The money that goes into the projects they do have to go into innovation to reduce the dependence on rare earths and critical materials and improve the efficiency of use. There's no money at all for basic research. And I think that's a great, that's a great approach. So in, in Australia, what do I think we should do? We certainly should not be picking winners. I think we should be uh, having some initiative like they have in the US where we support research. Uh, in our case, probably to support more, more research into developing processes to process our ores and, and um, 
arcane uh, resources has received funding, so has Northern Minerals and, and so have Arafura, all rare earth companies. So they've all benefited from that and I think uh, that should continue. Apart from that, I think that the government should be making every effort it can to make sure we have a level playing field. And I talked about establishing independent supply chains, supply chains that uh, are independent of China and where the government can, it should be facilitating discussions between the original equip manufa equipment manufacturers and, and the primary producers and identifying people in, in the supply chain in between to come to an arrangement whereby we can have a supply chain that's independent of China. But Australia's role should be encouragement and, and probably funding of research, but certainly not championing a cause unduly or putting a whole lot of money in trying to pick, pick a winner.